Essay Eight of Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Essay Eight Beauty. Was never form and never face so sweet to say as only grace, which did not slumber like a stone but hovered gleaming and was gone. Beauty chased he everywhere in flame, in storm, in clouds of air. He smote the lake to feed his eye with the barrel beam of the broken wave. He flung in pebbles well to hear the moment's music which they gave. Oft pealed for him a lofty tone from nodding pole and belting zone. He heard a voice none else could hear, from centred and from errant sphere. The quaking earth did quake in rhyme. Seas ebbed and flowed in epic chime. In dens of passion and pits of woe, he saw strong eros struggling through to send the dark and solve the curse and beam to the bounds of the universe while thus to love he gave his days in loyal worship scorning praise how spread their lures for him in vain thieving ambition and paltering gain he thought it happier to be dead to die for beauty than live for bread beauty the spiral tendency of vegetation infects education also. Our books approach very slowly the things we most wish to know. What a parade we make of our science, and how far off and at arm's length it is from its objects. Our botany is all names, not powers. Poets and romancers talk of herbs of grace and healing. But what does the botanist know of the virtues of his weeds? The geologist lays bare the strata, and can tell them all on his fingers. But does he know what effect passes into the man who builds his house in them? What effect on the race that inhabits a granite shelf? What on the inhabitants of marl and of alluvium? We should go to the ornithologist with a new feeling if he could teach us what the social birds say when they sit in the autumn council, talking together in the trees. The want of sympathy makes his record a dull dictionary. His result is a dead bird. The bird is not in its ounces and inches, but in its relations to nature, and the skin or skeleton you show me is no more a heron than a heap of ashes or a bottle of gases into which his body has been reduced is Dante or Washington. The naturalist is led from the road by the whole distance of his fancied advance. The boy had juster views when he gazed at the shells on the beach, or the flowers in the meadow, unable to call them by their names, than the man in the pride of his nomenclature. Astrology interested us, for it tied man to the system. Instead of an isolated beggar, the farthest star felt him, and he felt the star. However rash and however falsified by pretenders and traitors in it, the hint was true and divine the soul's avowal of its large relations, and that climate, century, remote natures as well as near, are part of its biography. Chemistry takes to pieces, but it does not construct. Alchemy, which sought to transmute one element into another, to prolong life, to arm with power, that was in the right direction. All our science lacks a human side. The tenant is more than the house bugs and stamens and spores on which we lavish so many years are not finalities and man when his powers unfold in order will take nature along with him and emit light into all her recesses the human heart concerns us more than the pouring into microscopes and is larger than can be measured by the pompous figures of the astronomer we are just so frivolous and sceptical men hold themselves cheap and vile and yet a man is a faggot of thunderbolts all the elements pour through his system he is the flood of the flood and fire of the fire he feels the antipodes and the pole as drops of his blood they are the extension of his personality his duties are measured by that instrument he is and a right and perfect man would be felt to the centre of the copernican system it is curious that we only believe as deep as we live. 
we do not think heroes can exert any more awful power than that surface play which amuses us a deep man believes in miracles waits for them believes in magic believes that the orator will decompose his adversary believes that the evil eye can wither that the heart's blessing can heal that love can exalt talent can overcome all odds from a great heart secret magnetisms flow incessantly to draw great events but we prize very humble utilities a prudent husband a good son a voter a citizen and deprecate any romance of character and perhaps reckon only his money value his intellect his affection as a sort of bill of exchange easily convertible into fine chambers pictures music and wine the motive of science was the extension of man on all sides into nature till his hands should touch the stars his eyes see through the earth his ears understand the language of beast and bird and the sense of the wind and through his sympathy heaven and earth should talk with him but that is not our science these geologies chemistries astronomies seem to make wise but they leave us where they found us the invention is of use to the inventor of questionable help to any other the formulas of science are like the papers in your pocket-book of no value to any but the owner science in england in america is jealous of theory hates the name of love and moral purpose there's a revenge for this inhumanity what manner of man does science make the boy is not attracted he says i do not wish to be such a kind of man as my professor is the collector has dried all the plants in his herbal but he's lost weight and humour he has got all snakes and lizards in his files but science has done for him also and has put the man into a bottle our reliance on the physician is a kind of despair of ourselves the clergy have bronchitis which does not seem a certificate of spiritual health macready thought it came of the falsetto of their voicing an indian prince tisso one day riding in the forest saw a herd of elk sporting see how happy he said these browsing elks are why should not priests lodged and fed comfortably in the temples also amuse themselves returning home he imparted this reflection to the king the king on the next day conferred the sovereignty on him saying prince administer this empire for seven days at the termination of that period i shall put thee to death at the end of the seventh day the king inquired from what cause hast thou become so emaciated he answered from the horror of death the monarch rejoined live my child and be wise thou hast ceased to take recreation saying to thyself in seven days i shall be put to death these priests in the temple incessantly meditate on death how can they enter into healthful diversions but the men of science or the doctors or the clergy are not victims of their pursuits more than others the miller the lawyer and the merchant dedicate themselves to their own details and do not come out men of more force have they divination grand aims hospitality of soul and the equality to any event which we demand in man or only the reactions of the mill of the wares of the chicane no object really interests us but man and in man only his superiorities and though we are aware of a perfect law in nature it has fascination for us only through its relation to him or as it is rooted in the mind at the birth of winkleman more than a hundred years ago side by side with his arid departmental post-mortem science rose an enthusiasm in the study of beauty and perhaps some sparks from it may yet light a conflagration in the other knowledge of men knowledge of manners the power of form and our sensibility to personal influence never go out of fashion these are facts of a science which we study without book whose teachers and subjects are always near us so inveterate is our habit of criticism that much of our knowledge in this direction belongs to the chapter of pathology the crowd in the street oftener furnishes degradations than angels or redeemers but they all prove the transparency every spirit makes its house 
and we can give a shrewd guess from the house to the inhabitant. But not less does nature furnish us with every sign of grace and goodness. The delicious faces of children, the beauty of schoolgirls, the sweet seriousness of sixteen, the lofty air of well-born, well-bred boys, the passionate histories in the looks and manners of youth and early manhood, and the varied power in all that well-known company that escorts us through life. We know how these forms thrill, paralyze, provoke, inspire, and enlarge us. Beauty is the form under which the intellect prefers to study the world. All privilege is that of beauty, for there are many beauties, as of general nature, of the human face and form, of manners, of brain, or method, moral beauty, or beauty of the soul. The ancients believed that a genius or demon took possession at birth of each mortal to guide him, that these genii were sometimes seen as a flame of fire partly immersed in the bodies which they governed, on an evil man resting on his head, in a good man mixed with his substance. They thought the same genius, at the death of its ward, entered a newborn child, and they pretended to guess the pilot by the sailing of the ship. We recognize obscurely the same fact, though we give it our own names. We say that every man is entitled to be valued by his best moment. We measure our friends so. We know they have intervals of folly, whereof we take no heed, but wait the reappearings of the genius, which are sure and beautiful. On the other side, everybody knows people who appear to be ridden, and who, with all degrees of ability, never impress us with the air of free agency. They know it too, and peep with their eyes to see if you detect their sad plight. We fancy, could we pronounce the solving word and disenchant them, the cloud would roll up, the little rider would be discovered and unseated, and they would regain their freedom. The remedy seems never to be far off, since the first step into thought lifts this mountain of necessity. Thought is the pent air-ball which can rive the planet, and the beauty which certain objects have for him is the friendly fire which expands the thought and acquaints the prisoner that liberty and power await him. The question of beauty takes us out of surfaces to thinking of the foundations of things. Goethe said, quote, The beautiful is a manifestation of secret laws of nature, which, but for this appearance, had been forever concealed from us. End quote. And the working of this deep instinct makes all the excitement, much of it superficial and absurd enough, about works of art, which leads armies of vain travellers every year to Italy, Greece, and Egypt. Every man values every acquisition he makes in the science of beauty above his possessions. The most useful man in the most useful world, so long as only commodity was served, would remain unsatisfied. But as fast as he sees beauty, life acquires a very high value. I am warned by the ill fate of many philosophers not to attempt a definition of beauty. I will rather enumerate a few of its qualities. We ascribe beauty to that which is simple, which has no superfluous parts, which exactly answers its end, which stands related to all things, which is the mean of many extremes. It is the most enduring quality and the most ascending quality. We say love is blind, and the figure of Cupid is drawn with a bandage round his eyes. Blind, yes, because he does not see what he does not like, but the sharpest-sighted hunter in the universe is love, for finding what he seeks and only that. And the mythologists tell us that Vulcan was painted lame, and Cupid blind, to call attention to the fact that one was all limbs and the other all eyes. In the true mythology, love is an immortal child, and beauty leads him as a guide. Nor can we express a deeper sense than when we say, beauty is the pilot of the young soul. Beyond their sensuous delight, the forms and colors of nature have a new charm for us in our perception, that not one ornament was added for ornament, but is a sign of some better health or more excellent action. Elegance of form in bird or beast or in the human figure marks some excellence of structure, or beauty is only an invitation from what belongs to us. 
tis a law of botany that in plants the same virtues follow the same forms it is a rule of largest application true in a plant true in a loaf of bread that in the construction of any fabric or organism any real increase of fitness to its end is an increase of beauty the lesson taught by the study of greek and of gothic art of antique and of pre-raphaelite painting was worth all the research namely that all beauty must be organic that outside embellishment is deformity it is the soundness of the bones that ultimates itself in a peach bloom complexion health of constitution that makes the sparkle and the power of the eye it is the adjustment of the size and of the joining of the sockets of the skeleton that gives grace of outline and the finer grace of movement the cat and the deer cannot move or sit inelegantly the dancing master can never teach a badly built man to walk well the tint of the flower proceeds from its root and the lustres of the seashell begin with its existence hence our taste in building rejects paint and all shifts and shows the original grain of the wood refuses pilasters and columns that support nothing and allows the real supporters of the house honestly to show themselves every necessary or organic action pleases the beholder a man leading a horse to water a farmer sowing seed the labors of haymakers in the field the carpenter building a ship the smith at his forge or whatever useful labor is becoming to the wise eye but if it is done to be seen it is mean how beautiful are ships on the sea but ships in the theatre or ships kept for picturesque effect on virginia water by george the fourth and men hired to stand in fitting costumes at a penny an hour what a difference in effect between a battalion of troops marching to action and one of our independent companies on a holiday in the midst of a military show and a festal procession gay with banners i saw a boy seize an old tin pan that lay rusting under a wall and poising it on the top of a stick he set it turning and made it describe the most elegant imaginable curves and drew away attention from the decorated procession by this startling beauty another text from the mythologists the greeks fabled that venus was born of the foam of the sea nothing interests us which is stark or bounded but only what streams with life what is in act or endeavour to reach somewhat beyond the pleasure a palace or a temple gives the eye is that an order and method has been communicated to stones so that they speak and geometrize become tender or sublime with expression beauty is the moment of transition as if the form were just ready to flow into other forms any fixedness heaping or concentration on one feature a long nose a sharp chin a humpback is the reverse of the flowing and therefore deformed beautiful as is the symmetry of any form if the form can move we seek a more excellent symmetry the interruption of equilibrium stimulates the eye to desire the restoration of symmetry and to watch the steps through which it is attained this is the charm of running water sea waves the flight of birds and the locomotion of animals this is the theory of dancing to recover continually in changes the lost equilibrium not by abrupt and angular but by gradual and curving movements i have been told by persons of experience in matters of taste that the fashions follow a law of gradation and are never arbitrary the new mode is always only a step onward in the same direction as the last mode and a cultivated eye is prepared for and predicts the new fashion this fact suggests the reason of all mistakes and offence in our own modes it is necessary in music when you strike a discord to let down the ear by an intermediate note or two to the accord again and many a good experiment born of good sense and destined to succeed fails only because it is offensively sudden i suppose the parisian milliner who dresses the world from her imperious boudoir will know how to reconcile the bloomer costume to the eye of mankind and make it triumphant over punch himself by interposing the just gradations i need not say how wide the same law ranges and how much it can be hoped to effect 
all that is a little harshly claimed by progressive parties may easily come to be conceded without question if this rule be observed thus the circumstances may be easily imagined in which woman may speak vote argue causes legislate and drive a coach and all the most naturally in the world if only it comes by degrees to this streaming or flowing belongs the beauty that all circular movement has as the circulation of waters the circulation of the blood the periodical motion of planets the annual wave of vegetation the action and reaction of nature and if we follow it out this demand in our thought for an ever onward action is the argument for the immortality one more text from the mythologists is to the same purpose beauty rides on a lion beauty rests on necessities the line of beauty is the result of perfect economy the cell of the bee is built at that angle which gives the most strength with the least wax the bone or the quill of the bird gives the most ailer strength with the least weight it is the purgation of superfluities said michelangelo there is not a particle to spare in natural structures there is a compelling reason in the uses of the plant for every novelty of colour or form and our art saves material by more skilful arrangement and reaches beauty by taking every superfluous ounce that can be spared from a wall and keeping all its strength in the poetry of columns in rhetoric this art of omission is its chief secret of power and in general it is proof of high culture to say the greatest matters in the simplest way veracity first of all and for ever rien de beau qui le vrai in all design art lies in making your object prominent but there is a prior art in choosing objects that are prominent the fine arts have nothing casual but spring from the instincts of the nations that created them beauty is the quality which makes to endure in a house that i know i have noticed a block of spermaceti lying about closets and mantelpieces for twenty years together simply because the tallow man gave it the form of a rabbit and i suppose it may continue to be lugged about unchanged for a century let an artist scrawl a few lines or figures on the back of a letter and that scrap of paper is rescued from danger is put in portfolio is framed and glazed and in proportion to the beauty of the lines drawn will be kept for centuries burns writes a copy of verses and sends them to a newspaper and the human race take charge of them that they shall not perish as the flute is heard farther than the cart see how surely a beautiful form strikes the fancy of men and is copied and reproduced without end how many copies are there of the belvedere apollo the venus the psyche the warwick vase the parthenon and the temple of vesta these are objects of tenderness to all in our cities an ugly building is soon removed and is never repeated but any beautiful building is copied and improved upon so that all masons and carpenters work to repeat and preserve the agreeable forms whilst the ugly ones die out the felicities of design in art or in works of nature are shadows or forerunners of that beauty which reaches its perfection in the human form all men are its lovers wherever it goes it creates joy and hilarity and everything is permitted to it it reaches its height in woman to eve say the mohammedans god gave two-thirds of all beauty a beautiful woman is a practical poet taming her savage mate planting tenderness hope and eloquence in all whom she approaches some favours of condition must go with it since a certain serenity is essential but we love its reproofs and superiorities nature wishes that woman should attract man yet she often cunningly moulds into her face a little sarcasm which seems to say yes i am willing to attract but to attract a little better kind of a man than any i yet behold french memoirs of the fifteenth century celebrate the name of pauline de viguere a virtuous and accomplished maiden who so fired the enthusiasm of her contemporaries by her enchanting form that the citizens of her native city of toulouse obtained the aid of the civil authorities to compel her to appear publicly on the balcony at least twice a week and as often as she showed herself 
the crowd was dangerous to life. Not less in England in the last century was the fame of the Gunnings, of whom Elizabeth married the Duke of Hamilton, and Maria, the Earl of Coventry. Walpole says, quote, The concourse was so great when the Duchess of Hamilton was presented at court on Friday that even the noble crowd in the drawing-room clambered on chairs and tables to look at her. There are mobs at their doors to see them get into their chairs, and people go early to get places at the theatres when it is known they will be there. End quote. Such crowds, he adds elsewhere, quote, flock to see the Duchess of Hamilton, that seven hundred people sat up all night in and about an inn in Yorkshire to see her get into her post-chaise next morning. End quote. But why need we console ourselves with the fames of Helen of Argus, or Corinna, or Pauline of Toulouse, or the Duchess of Hamilton? We all know this magic very well, or can divine it. It does not hurt weak eyes to look into beautiful eyes never so long. Women stand related to beautiful nature around us, and the enamoured youth mixes their form with moon and stars, with woods and waters, and the pomp of summer. They heal us of awkwardness by their words and looks. We observe their intellectual influence on the most serious student. They refine and clear his mind, teach him to put a pleasing method into what is dry and difficult. We talk to them and wish to be listened to. We fear to fatigue them and acquire a facility of expression which passes from conversation into habit of style. That beauty is the normal state is shown by the perpetual effort of nature to attain it. Mirabeau had an ugly face on a handsome ground, and we see faces every day which have a good type, but have been marred in the casting. A proof that we are all entitled to beauty should have been beautiful if our ancestors had kept the laws, as every lily and every rose is well. But our bodies do not fit us, but caricature and satirize us. Thus, short legs, which constrain us to short, mincing steps, are a kind of personal insult and contumely to the owner, and long stilts again put him at perpetual disadvantage and force him to stoop to the general level of mankind. Marshall ridicules a gentleman of his day whose countenance resembled the face of a swimmer seen under water. Sadi describes a schoolmaster, quote, so ugly and crabbed that a sight of him would derange the ecstasies of the orthodox, end quote. Faces are rarely true to any ideal type, but are a record in sculpture of a thousand anecdotes of whim and folly. Portrait painters say that most faces and forms are irregular and unsymmetrical, have one eye blue and one grey, the nose not straight, and one shoulder higher than another, the hair unequally distributed, etc. The man is physically as well as metaphysically a thing of shreds and patches, borrowed unequally from good and bad ancestors, and a misfit from the start. A beautiful person among the Greeks was thought to betray by this sign some secret favour of the immortal gods, and we can pardon pride when a woman possesses such a vigour, that wherever she stands or moves or leaves a shadow on the wall, or sits for a portrait to the artist, she confers a favour on the world. And yet, it is not beauty that inspires the deepest passion. Beauty without grace is the hook without the bait. Beauty without expression tires. Abbe Ménage said of the President La Bayeux, quote, that he was fit for nothing but to sit for his portrait, end quote. A Greek epigram intimates that the force of love is not shown by the courting of beauty, but when the like desire is inflamed for one who is ill-favoured. And petulant old gentlemen who have chanced to suffer some intolerable weariness from pretty people, or who have seen cut flowers to some profusion, or who see, after a world of pains have been successfully taken for the costume, how the least mistaken sentiment takes all the beauty out of your clothes, affirm that the secret of ugliness consists not in irregularity, but in being uninteresting. We love any forms, however ugly, from which great qualities shine. If command, eloquence, art, or invention exist in the most deformed person, all the accidents that usually displease, please, and raise esteem and wonder higher. The great orator was an emaciated, insignificant person, but he was all brain. 
Cardinal de Retz said of de Bouillon, quote, with the physiognomy of an ox, he had the perspicacity of an eagle. End quote. It was said of Hook, the friend of Newton, quote, he is the most and promises the least of any man in England. End quote. Since I am so ugly, said Du Guesclin, quote, it behooves that I be bold. End quote. Sir Philip Sidney, the darling of mankind, Ben Jonson tells us, quote, was no pleasant man in countenance, his face being spoiled with pimples and of high blood and long. End quote. Those who have ruled human destinies like planets for thousands of years were not handsome men. If a man can raise a small city to be a great kingdom, can make bread cheap, can irrigate deserts, can join oceans by canals, can subdue steam, can organize victory, can lead the opinions of mankind, can enlarge knowledge, it is no matter whether his nose is parallel to his spine, as it ought to be, or whether he has the nose at all, whether his legs are straight or whether his legs are amputated, his deformities will come to be reckoned ornamental and advantageous on the whole. This is the triumph of expression, degrading beauty, charming us with a power so fine and friendly and intoxicating that it makes admired persons insipid, and the thought of passing our lives with them unsupportable. There are faces so fluid of expression, so flushed and rippled by the play of thought, that we can hardly find what the mere features really are. When the delicious beauty of liniments loses its power, it is because a more delicious beauty has appeared, that an interior and durable form has been disclosed. Still, beauty rides on our lion as before. Still, quote, it was for beauty that the world was made, end quote. The lives of the Italian artists, who established the despotism of genius amidst the dukes and kings and mobs of their stormy epoch, prove how loyal men in all times are to a finer brain, a finer method than their own. If a man can cut such a head on his stone gatepost as shall draw and keep a crowd about it all day by its beauty, good nature, and inscrutable meaning, if a man can build a plain cottage with such symmetry as to make all the fine palaces look cheap and vulgar, can take such advantage of nature that all her powers serve him, making use of geometry instead of expense, tapping a mountain for his water-jet, causing the sun and moon to seem only the decorations of his estate. This is still the legitimate dominion of beauty. The radiance of the human form, though sometimes astonishing, is only a burst of beauty for a few years, or a few months, at the perfection of youth, and in most rapidly declines. But we remain lovers of it, only transferring our interest to interior excellence. And it is not only admirable in singular and salient talents, but also in the world of manners. But the sovereign attribute remains to be noted. Things are pretty, graceful, rich, elegant, handsome, but, until they speak to the imagination, not yet beautiful. This is the reason why beauty is still escaping out of all analysis. It is not yet possessed, it cannot be handled. Proclus says, quote, It swims on the light of forms. End quote. It is properly not in the form, but in the mind. It instantly deserts possession and flies to an object in the horizon. If I could put my hand on the North Star, would it be as beautiful? The sea is lovely, but when we bathe in it, the beauty forsakes all the near water. For the imagination and senses cannot be gratified at the same time. Wordsworth rightly speaks of, quote, a light that never was on sea or land, end quote, meaning that it was supplied by the observer, and the Welsh bard warns his countrywoman that, quote, half of their charms with Catwallon shall die. End quote. The new virtue which constitutes a thing beautiful is a certain cosmical quality, or a power to suggest relation to the whole world and so lift the object out of a pitiful individuality. Every natural feature, sea, sky, rainbow, flowers, musical tone, has in it somewhat which is not private, but universal, speaks of that central benefit which is the soul of nature, and thereby is beautiful. And, in chosen men and women, I find somewhat in form, 
speech and manners which is not of their person and family but of a humane catholic and spiritual character and we love them as the sky they have a largeness of suggestion and their face and manners carry a certain grandeur like time and justice the feat of the imagination is in showing the convertibility of everything into every other thing facts which had never before left their stark common sense suddenly figure as eleusinian mysteries my boots and chair and candlestick are fairies in disguise meteors and constellations all the facts in nature are nouns of the intellect and make the grammar of the internal language every word has a double treble or centuple use and meaning what has my stove and pepper pot a false bottom i cry you mercy good shoe-box i did not know you were a jewel-case chaff and dust begin to sparkle and are clothed about with immortality and there is a joy in perceiving the representative or symbolic character of a fact which no bare fact or event can ever give there are no days in life so memorable as those which vibrated to some stroke of the imagination the poets are quite right in decking their mistresses with the spoils of the landscape flower gardens gems rainbows flushes of morning and stars of night since all beauty points at identity and whatsoever thing does not express to me the sea and sky day and night is somewhat forbidden and wrong into every beautiful object there enters somewhat immeasurable and divine and just as much into form bounded by outlines like mountains on the horizon as into tones of music or depths of space polarized light showed the secret architecture of bodies and when the second side of the mind is opened now one colour or form or gesture and now another has a pungency as if a more interior ray had been admitted disclosing its deep holdings in the frame of things the laws of this translation we do not know or why one feature or gesture and chance why one word or syllable intoxicates but the fact is familiar that the fine touch of the eye or a grace of manners or a phrase of poetry plants wings at our shoulders as if the divinity in his approaches lifts away mountains of obstruction and deigns to draw a truer line which the mind knows and owns this is that haughty force of beauty vis superba forme which the poets praise under calm and precise outline the immeasurable and divine beauty hiding all wisdom and power in its calm sky all high beauty has a moral element in it and i find the antique sculpture as ethical as marcus antoninus and the beauty ever in proportion to the depth of thought gross and obscure natures however decorated seem impure shambles but character gives splendour to youth and all to wrinkled skin and grey hairs an adorer of truth we cannot choose but obey and the woman who has shared with us the moral sentiment her locks must appear to us sublime thus there is a climbing scale of culture from the first agreeable sensation which a sparkling gem or a scarlet stain affords the eye up through fair outlines and details of the landscape features of the human face and form signs and tokens of thought and character and manners up to the ineffable mysteries of the intellect wherever we begin thither our steps tend an ascent from the joy of a horse in his trappings up to the perception of newton that the globe on which we ride is only a larger apple falling from a larger tree up to the perception of plato that globe and universe are rude and early expressions of an all-dissolving unity the first stair on the scale to the temple of the mind. End of Essay 8